Those who know me know I quite like graphs and I quite like numbers. Um, I think a bit like you know when Bob Geldof organ organised Live Aid, the Boomtown Rats got to play. Well, if I'm organising this, I get to put some slides in front of you. Um, my, uh, what I will try and do is present them with some sort of you know, entertaining uh, PowerPoint graphics. Think of it, if you like, as, as Dave Gorman, but without the laughs. Um, and what I'm going to try and do, it, numbers and pictures. And I think for an audience of this size, and we're dealing with some quite complicated numbers in some cases, I'm mainly going to try and present some pictures. Because I think people can take away pictures, people can understand uh, shapes. And what I want to do is explain the narrative that we can create with the data and the narratives that others create with the data. So the first thing I'm going to look at is fiscal transfers. Now, I, won't, I don't have time to go into the detail of how these things are calculated, so you're going to have to bear with me. Fiscal transfers, basically, when Scotland contributes to being in the UK or when Scotland benefits from being in the UK due to the relative scale of Scotland's deficit. And this graph goes back 40 years. And the first thing we have is the oil boom in the 80s. And those black bars above the line are basically Scotland contributing to the rest of the UK because of oil revenues. And in the peak year there, it's about um, over £4,000 per capita for every man, woman and child in Scotland was the scale of Scotland's contribution to the UK. But then oil revenues faded off and those red lines are when Scotland is fiscally benefiting from being in the UK. So you then had a period through the 90s where Scotland benefited. Um, let's see if I can deal with this level of technology. Can I do that? I can't see. There we go. Uh, oh, no. Back. Let's just do it that way. So when Scotland um, benefited, and then really importantly, actually, coming into the independence referendum, there was a mini oil boom, and we'll talk about the detail behind that. So there was then a period where instead of being it's Scotland's oil, basically a selfish argument for independence, why should we be sending this money down to, down to the rest of the UK? It then shifted to being, well, we more than pay our way. And actually, if you look at those years, uh, you know, the years into sort of 2012-13, remember these were the numbers that were being used in the independence referendum. Well, three out of those five, six years Scotland contributed. If you look at those, we, we, you know, we're paying our way. It was a different argument. It's no longer a selfish argument as much as it's a, well, why shouldn't we argument. Now, the nature of economic data is it gets updated and upgraded and refreshed. And I don't have time to go through the detail of this, but really all you need to know is that the, the, the dark black line there is the latest view of what those numbers should be. The Scottish Government economists' latest view of what those numbers should be. And this doesn't get talked about very much, but that the level of, um, basically the relative um, scale of Scotland's deficit has been revised up because the allocation of oil revenues has been revised down. We could spend 10 minutes talking about that. I won't. All you really need to know is this is now accepted as the best available picture of those fiscal transfers. So what's the story? It's Scotland's oil, we should be independent. Well, actually we're benefiting. No, it's all right, we're paying our way, so we may as well be independent. But now what's happened? Now, oil revenues have died away, and Scotland, famously, is now a net beneficiary of being in the UK in terms of fiscal transfers. So now the argument is, well, here's why we should be independent, because obviously the UK isn't working for Scotland, because now we need the rest of the UK. And if you think about it in terms of you know, nationalist narratives, it doesn't matter what the fiscal transfer situation is. It's always a reason for independence. Because we're contributing, because we pay our way, or because we're not contributing. And if you think about it, it's quite an extraordinary narrative that the nationalists now have to sell. Because we benefit from being in the UK, that's why we should be independent, because it proves the UK isn't working. And if I see some kind of glazed eyes in the audience, because it is a really weird argument, but that is the argument. What's nice is if you fill this in, so obviously black, Scotland contributes. Red, Scotland benefits. And there's a not bad symmetry to this. And amazingly, if you add up those areas, it is almost exactly the same. So over the last 40 years, pooling and sharing of resources through the UK, causing grievance at either end, has actually meant that Scotland's got back what it gave to the rest of the UK. Pooling and sharing over those 40 years works which is a wonderful advert for the UK, I would argue. And yet, you know, as you can see, it's the source of, source of grievances. And so where you end up now today is Scotland benefits from this famous £2,000 per capita fiscal transfer, 10.7 billion, or let's say 10 billion for easy round numbers. That's what Scotland benefits from, from being in the UK at the moment, and that's why the nationalists will now say, well, that proves the UK is broken. Well, what I want to do is focus in now on the last 20 years. And I want you to remember that shape, 
Remember the red and the little peak of black, which is the one year in the last 20 that Scotland actually was a fiscal contributor to the UK. And we're going to understand why, because the why is quite important here. So the first line I'm just putting on this graph is Scotland's onshore revenue per capita versus the rest of the UK. It's basically saying, forget oil and gas for a moment, how does Scotland's economy perform in terms of generating tax revenues relative to the rest of the UK? And it generates you know, between 200 and 400 pounds less. Again, we could have a 15 minute discussion about what's happened in the last four years, but we're focusing on the big picture here. So to focus on the big picture, we have to add oil and gas. So what I'm now looking at, the black line, is if you add oil and gas revenues generated, attributed to Scotland, and we can have a debate about that, but if you allocate Scotland all the North Sea oil and gas, suddenly Scotland is generating way more tax revenue per capita than the rest of the UK. And this is a really important narrative, and was a really important narrative for the SNP and the Yes Calls in, in, in 2014, because they could say, for the last 30 years, Scotland has generated more revenue per capita than the rest of the UK, therefore, guess what, that's why Scotland should be independent. But then we know what happened. Oil revenues crashed. And so suddenly we, we went from that position to being, well, actually now Scotland doesn't generate more tax revenue than the rest of the UK. We'll come on to show that's actually not a very significant reduction, uh, but Scotland now generates a little bounce on, on oil and gas, a couple of hundred pounds less. But what tends not to get talked about by the nationalists is the red line. And the red line is how much Scotland's per capita expenditure exceeds that of the UK average. And you can see, starting at the left-hand end there, that was around £1,000 higher spending per average in Scotland than the rest of the UK. Up to here, £1,700 higher spending per average than the rest of the UK. And if you think that this is being used as an argument to say that the UK doesn't work for Scotland, it's quite remarkable. The UK has worked incredibly well for Scotland. The Barnet formula has worked incredibly well for Scotland. And again, we could, we could debate the detail of that. But what you end up with here then is that £2,000 explained. So that £2,000 that Scotland is benefiting from from being in the UK is made up of £1,700 higher spending and £300 lower revenue. That's why Scotland's deficit is that much bigger. That's how much we benefit by. Now, remember I asked you to remember that shape. That's that shape. So. If you think about what's happening here, if you take away oil and gas revenues, then there's what I like to refer to as the onshore deficit. There has been, for the last 20 years and longer, an underlying onshore deficit. That is, slightly less revenue generated onshore and a lot more spending. Therefore, Scotland would consistently be a beneficiary from being in the UK were it not for that washing in of oil and gas revenues. You think about it as a, as a wave against the shore at Sullum Vaux that sort of washes in and wipes out that deficit gap. And in a good year, completely wipes out that deficit gap. But so that's why none of us were surprised when oil revenues crashed and suddenly Scotland becomes a net benef beneficiary of fiscal transfers, because it was always going to happen. So that's Scotland relative to the rest of the UK. I'm going to go through this very quickly. I hope people know this, but it's worth remembering. UK's deficit history. Not that long ago that actually the UK did run a, a surplus. Started running deficit, financial crash, and then for the last 10 years, the UK's deficit has been reducing at the price of austerity. Uh, and we can, again, we can debate the way that was implemented, but the net result in terms of deficit reduction has been very consistent. And of course, if you draw the same line for, the, for Scotland, well, we kind of know what it's going to show because we've just sort of seen it. Scotland's deficit has not been reducing. Now, again, this is used as an argument for independence. That bottom graph shows that the UK isn't working for Scotland, except Scots share the UK's deficit. So any Scots in this room, that top graph is your deficit. That's the whole point. We pool and share. In terms of the scale of Scotland's deficit challenge, it's worth saying the 3% EU excessive deficit threshold is often mentioned. What's mentioned less often is the 0.5% EU fiscal compact, which is what's actually targeted through the economic cycle. And as Ronnie may come on to discuss in terms of uh, launching your own currency, you probably need to be thinking about getting into a surplus. But remember, the UK isn't working for Scotland. That's, that's the nationalist narrative. That's what we need to reverse. And to reverse that, I'm going to suggest an analogy. And I want you to bear with me. I want you to indulge me, because I think you'll find it's worth indulging me when we get to the end of this. Just think about what happens when you go out for a meal and you split the bill. If your bill would have been more expensive than the average and you split it equally, then you benefit. 
And if you think about it, what you're effectively getting is a transfer from the other people you're having dinner with. My meal cost 150 quid, yours cost 100. We say we'll split the bill, I pay 125 quid. You would have paid 100, but by sharing the bill, you're paying 125 quid. You've effectively transferred 25 pounds to me. And of course, that's what happens. Oh, sorry, I should say, you know, we've all been there splitting the bill. You're out for supper with the lads, um, and someone will always complain. <laughs> there's, always, there's always room for a grievance. He had the more expensive starter. And you're a smart audience. You can see where this is going. When we split the deficit bill, we do that by sharing the UK's debt on a population basis. The debt is obviously the accumulation of the effect of all of those deficits, the accumulation of all of those bills. So we're splitting the bill. And so when I was showing those graphs of fiscal transfers, all you're looking at is, would my bill have been more expensive than the average bill that I've ended up paying? That's all that's happening when we, when, when we talk about fiscal transfers. And of course, it's the same thing. It's just the grievances are different. So now it's, yeah, but they get more infrastructure investment. Or I wouldn't have paid that big a tip. Or I wouldn't have paid that much on international development aid. You know, you can, you can stretch the analogy. So having understood that that's what this is all about. It's all about splitting the bill. That's what we do in the UK. And we've focused on Scotland. I now want to focus on the English regions and the other devolved administrations. I have to move to a different data set to be able to use regional data. It means the numbers change, but the story doesn't. So I'm going to need to have a little glass of water. Can I get a glass of water? Um, so I'm absolutely... Um, trying to present quickly makes, you, makes your mouth dry up, I've discovered. So what this shows, obviously, the reasons of the UK and the devolved administrations, and the first question is, who generates more revenue than the rest of the United Kingdom, or more than the average, I should say, to be correct? And I think most people know this, it's London and the South East, and to a certain extent, the, the East of England. So these are people generating more revenue per capita, higher economic activity, um, generating higher revenue per capita, and therefore, of course, by definition, all the other areas generate less revenue per capita. And what's kind of interesting here is Scotland doesn't generate that much less revenue per capita. A couple of hundred quid on this data, 300 quid on the JAIRS data, it's not that much less. Whereas Wales, £2,800 less. So remember yesterday, Gordon was striding the stage and running off all of these percentages. This is what he was talking about in, in, in different form. What he was talking about was the fact that you've got areas that are far less economically productive relative to their population. And of course, here in the Northeast, £2,700 less revenue per capita. So when we talk about levelling up, when we talk about trying to push economic activity into other areas of the UK, it's about getting those red bars lifted up, which by default, well, necessarily means those black bars come down. So there's a big uh, levelling up challenge across the UK, but it's not about Scotland when it comes to economic activity. But there's also the expenditure side, side of the equation, which is... Who spends less than average per capita in the UK? So you can see, you know, most of central and, and southern England. Who spends more? Famously, yes, Scotland, sorry, London does have higher spend per capita than the rest of the UK, and that is often a source of grievance. Um, but the largest, the second largest number is Scotland. 1,700 on the, on the previous numbers, rounds to the same number. Second only to Northern Ireland as of, in terms of getting public expenditure per capita. But you look at Wales in the North East, and remember how big their revenue per capita challenge was, and they're getting significantly less spending than Scotland on a per capita basis. So there's some, there's some imbalances here that have to be considered. Now, if you add those two things together, then you get the fiscal transfers. So fiscal transfers come out of London and the South East, come into the rest of the UK. And so Scotland gets 1,900, it was 2,000 on the other data, 10 billion ahead of fiscal transfer in. Northern Ireland, over 4,000 pounds ahead. Wales, nearly 4,000 pounds ahead. The North East, 3,500 pounds ahead. So fiscal transfers are not unusual in the UK. Scotland isn't some exceptional case in terms of getting these fiscal transfers. And, it, and not only the devolved administrations, but the English regions, there are lots of fiscal transfers going on. And if we kind of peel back a layer, and this may be too much detail, but just to sort of check we've followed the story here, Scotland, the first bar is the revenue difference, the second bar is the spending difference, and that gets you to the fiscal transfer. So Scotland's fiscal transfer is explained by higher spending. And that's a really important point to understand in, in the narrative. And in contrast, the larger fiscal transfers that exist for the North East and Wales, to pick two, two examples, are as a result of lower revenue generation, lower economic activity, rather than greater spend. And Northern Ireland is, is, it, it has both. 
It's both lower economic activity and higher spend. That's why it has the, the largest fiscal transfer. So where's the money spent? And I'm going to come back to Scotland now. You'll forgive me for running out of time to do animated graphics. Um, but that number there, £1,800, is how much Scotland's expenditure exceeds that of the rest of the UK, as opposed to the average of the UK. That's why it's 1800 not 1700 And the first thing to observe is when we're looking at the differences in expenditure per capita, which is the key narrative here, it's got nothing to do with defence and debt interest and international services, foreign aid, because that, those things are already allocated on a population basis. So they can't explain why Scotland spends more, because we just take that stuff and we split it, we split the bill on that stuff. So it's social protection, which is, as Gordon Brown was saying yesterday, pensions and welfare and benefits, which, by the way, are reserved, and that's one of the ways in which we know they get distributed based on need. But it's also education. You'll see down there, 18% higher spend, partly based on need, we, you know, remote island communities and all of that, but also free tuition fees. We spend more on transportation, a lot more. Uh, where's the number? 47% uh, in the most recent year, higher expenditure per capita on transportation than the rest of the UK and Scotland. Now again, there are good geographic reasons why that might be the case, but are they all explained by geography? I think that's an interesting debate to have. Healthcare, only in the verticoms 5% more on healthcare, and again, there may be demographic needs, uh, health issues, areas of endemic poverty that might explain that. But we also have free personal care in Scotland that doesn't exist in the rest of the UK. We have free prescriptions in Scotland that don't exist in the rest of the UK. I, it is not obvious that that higher spending in Scotland can all be justified by need. It is possible that some of that higher spending in Scotland is unfair on the rest of the UK. It's possible that some of that higher spending in Scotland gets used for freebies that help people win votes. We could debate that. I'm just going to do two, two last slides. I'm nearly done. To put this in context, if Scotland was to get to the UK's deficit, the one we already share by being in the UK, just by cutting public spending, there are of course other things they could do, just to illustrate the point. To get there by cutting public spending, you'd need to cut public spending by 14%. Now, through the austerity years, Scotland's spending, Scotland, not Scotland's budget, total managed expenditure, to, the total spending in Scotland, including uh, reserved, including shares of defence and debt interest, but if you look at that, the, the largest peak to trough drop, so over a three year period, I think 2010 to 2013, was 4.8% on a per capita basis, which is the, the toughest way to do it. I.e., we're talking about three times worse than austerity that we've just been through, just to get Scotland stand alone to the economic position that we're already in if you accept that we're splitting the bill with the rest of the UK. So it's a big challenge. And in that sense, you know, one of the debates here, and I worry a bit about some of the federalism debate, the extent to which that's moving towards sort of fiscal autonomy. If Scotland gains fiscal autonomy, we're no longer splitting the bill. There's various ways you can do it, and it's not quite as simple as that, but narratively, that's kind of what you're moving towards. And if you don't split the bill, then Scotland right now would be losing a £10 billion fiscal transfer. I think that's a really important kind of part of the narrative. And then I'm just going to set up a couple of things. Brexit, I haven't talked about Brexit, and this has come up a little bit over the, over the last sort of day or so. What Brexit means is that now Scotland has to make a choice about whether to be in the European single market, possibly, uh, or the UK single market. And if Scotland leaves the UK single market, it's leaving the market where 60% of its exports go. It introduces the currency conundrum. How do we, if Scotland is going to migrate to its own currency, how does it do so given the current the fiscal and current account deficits, and, and Ronnie will talk about that, I know. And, you know, more generally, it's unpicking a 300-year-old, more than 300-year-old union, rather than a less than 300-year-old union. So what we're talking about is unpicking deeply integrated machinery of state, things that are going to be far harder to do than, than anything we're experiencing with Brexit, i.e. what we're talking about is economic shock squared. It's, it's um, well, I'll come on to say it's, it's two wrongs don't make a right. So I'm going to summarise and get off the stage, but I'm not, I'm going to sit down there. So Scotland's benefiting to the tune of £2,000 a head, £10 billion a year from fiscal transfers because we split the bill. But that balances out over the last 40 years. It's just been pooling and sharing over time, so it's arguably not something we should get exercised by. Fiscal transfers exist across the UK. I would argue they're not a bad thing. The question is, what is creating those fiscal transfers? And I would argue that when those fiscal transfers are distributing of, distribution of spending based on need, they're a good thing. When those fiscal transfers are caused by uh, dips or, or troughs in, in, in economic activity, 
then there's more of a levelling up challenge that we could argue for. Scotland gets higher spend per capita than the rest of the UK on real stuff, on transportation and health and social welfare. And finally, I would argue, leaving the UK single market and currency union would be worse than Brexit. It would be a case of two wrongs don't make a right. How can, how can leaving this deeper, stronger union not be far harder than leaving the, 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 the looser union that, that, that is the EU, much as I would personally wish that we weren't leaving it?